God, we thank you that trouble doesn't last always. And God, we thank you that your word reminds us that there may be times of weeping. There may be times of pain, God. But Lord, we thank you that your, your grace and your mercy is renewed every morning. We thank you, God, that great is your faithfulness. For you're a good father. Take good care of your children. And we thank you. God, we come right now, Lord, asking that you give us ears to hear. Give us a, a heart and a will to do all the things that you've called us to. Now, God, help us to be attentive to your word that we might do everything you've called us to. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Give God a hand of praise. Amen. Amen. Uh, God is a faithful, faithful God. A good, good is good to, to be be back. Amen. We uh, thank God for Miss Marilyn. Amen. Who uh, stood in the gap on last week and, and blessed us. Amen. And many of us now know how to handle the in-between. Amen. Amen. And so we want to uh, continue our journey uh, through the book of Romans. So if you have your Bible, uh, turn to Romans chapter 10, your electronic device. Amen. And we're pressing our way. We're getting close to the end. Amen. There's so much good food in here. And so Romans chapter 10. I want you to focus your attention on verses 9 through 13. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 uh, through 13. And this is what the scripture says. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth resulting in salvation. Now the scripture says everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, since the same Lord of all is rich to all who call on him. Verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, will be saved. As we continue our, our journey through this series in Romans, Living the Faith Life, uh, today's uh, title is simply this, by faith alone, by faith, by faith. This is a thing that is done by faith. When we look at this, uh, these verses on the surface, this sounds kind of simple, amen, that, that, that is actually, uh, it's, it's not simple in our hearts because it seems like there's a struggle for folks to accept this gift that God has given by faith. Which, what, what do you mean? You mean all I have to do is simply confess and I'm saved? I mean, there's nothing else that, that, that I got to do. Come on, y'all got to have some, some rules, some regulations, some, some hoops I got to jump through. Don't I have to walk over some hot stones? It, it, it's something I got to do. Come on, Lord, let me help you out. Let me do something, right, to, to, to earn what you're giving me. I don't want you to give me nothing for free. Chuck Swindoll once stated that as humans, we, we seem to be addicted to doing something to earn our salvation. We, we just can't take it at face value. We, we want to do something, amen? Uh, the former Indianapolis coach, Tampa Bay uh, Buccaneer coach, uh, Tony Dungy, writes in his devotional Uncommon Life Daily Challenge, he says this, we see it all the time in the world. We work to get paid. We study to earn good grades. We plant and expect a harvest. We've heard the phrase, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Over and over, there is a causal relationship between our efforts and our production and prosperity. Yet salvation is a free gift from God. Contrary to everything we've ever known and been taught since birth. He goes on to say, however, our spiritual prosperity doesn't hinge on our efforts. The basis and foundation of our faith and the spiritual growth that occurs in our lives is in our relationship with Jesus Christ. See, that relationship is established not because of what we do, 
not because we do something to earn the right to the relationship, but simply because we recognize what Jesus did for us on the cross. He took all our sins and those of everyone everywhere upon himself. It cost him his life. You cannot do anything to earn it. It was given as a free gift requiring to simply accept it. See, now that, that, that's some great insight from a football coach. Amen. See, we find that many well-meaning folks trying to pay off God for his gift. I thank you, Jesus. I appreciate how you went to the cross for me, but, but I'm going to do something for you. You, you know, thank you for that great, great sacrifice. You know what? I'm, 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 I'm going to come. I'm going to sing in your choir. I, I, I'm going to come. I'm going to do your, your, your Bible study. I'm going to treat people good. Amen. Because I, I really don't want you to give me this thing for free. I, I got to kind of participate in it some kind of way. Amen. See, 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 we miss the fact that we can't give help anything for it. Amen. We're trying to pay off God for a gift that is free, a gift that he's already worked for. Amen. See, Jesus worked his way. Amen. Down from heaven and paid the full price. For our sins. See, we have a deep down desire to work for it. Because when we work for it, we can brag about it. See, see, when we work for it, we, we can get them pats on the back. When, when, when we work for it, it, it seems like, listen, I participated in this. I earned it. Amen. When we work for it, we become proud of it. It's something that we did. Amen. We get to hang our salvation certificate on the wall with our name signed on it when actually it's been signed already in blood. Amen. See, salvation is a free gift, uh, not pay for services rendered. Amen. It, it's not a bonus for our hard work. It's, it's a gift. And the only way to accept the gift is by faith. And that brings us to what's going to be driving the car today as we uh, look at the principle, the gospel is a message of faith that must be believed by faith in Jesus Christ alone. See, the faith in Christ, our, our faith, it's our responsibility. See, we've been looking at the fact that we see all throughout the, the word of God. That, that, that God is the one who orchestrates. God is in control, and yet we are still responsible for our decisions. Amen? We are responsible for placing our faith in Christ alone. That's our responsibility. We'll see two things as we walk through these verses today. The first thing we see is that we must do our part. Amen? You, you got to do something. A amen? It doesn't earn credit with God, but it is something that you must do do in our party is simply to believe amen we have to believe the message of faith and, and the second thing we'll see is that God does his part he saves we believe he saves God does his part we must do our part so so why is this important why is this important those of us that believe in Christ by faith must remember that salvation by faith alone through Christ alone is how it goes. Our responsibility is to believe and place our faith in Christ. God's promise to save us and to transform us, that's his part. And this gift is available to everyone. Amen. I know it's some folk that you don't want to see up in heaven. Yeah, I, I, come on, man, y'all, come on, let's be real, let's be real. Y'all know some folk, you like, if they get in, amen, God did something wrong. But, but it's available to everyone. Let's get a little context. In Romans 9, uh, chapter 9, we saw uh, a couple weeks ago that God's chosen people had rejected God's gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. It was clear in the scripture. God had provided them with everything that they needed that pointed to the coming Messiah. We learned that they had, they had the law. They, they had the patriarchs. They had the prophets. They had the promises. Amen. They, they had all these things. They had the, the, the privilege of serving in the temple. They had the festivals, the Passover, all these things. Yet, 
they missed the very one that God had been pointing them to. Amen. He had done all that he could to show them their Savior, but yet they missed him. See, see, they missed him. They, they, they rejected Santa Claus at Christmas time. Even though they, they knew he was coming. They had the Christmas tree. They had the Christmas list. They, they had seen the elves and the reindeer. They even played Christmas carols. But when Santa showed up in his red suit, bearing the gifts that, that were on their list, they rejected him and said, you're not Santa Claus. We're looking for someone else. Hey, amen. Listen, they, everything was pointing to the Messiah. God had laid it out for them. And yet when he showed himself, bearing the very gift that God had promised on the cross, they missed the gift. Israel rejected the one bearing the gift of salvation, yet it did not nullify God's promises to Israel. Uh, amen. They were still God's chosen people, and he wasn't finished with them yet. Uh, uh, that, that, that right there is a little shout moment. I'm sorry about for the stutter. But that, that right there got to me real good because, listen, you may mess up, but God does not break his promise to you. Amen. It did, I, I don't know about you. I get excited because Israel was messed up. Read the Old Testament. I know we like to specialize in the New Testament. You need to go back to the Old Testament. You think you messed up, amen, and, and we did, amen, but Israel messed up, but God kept his promise to them, amen. He's not finished with them yet, amen. We saw on a couple weeks ago that God knows what he is doing because what would happen is that because Israel rejected God's uh, a gift of in the Messiah, that many of us would think, well, well, wait a minute, God, did, 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 did you, if you broke your promise to them, if they didn't come, uh, what makes you think that my salvation is secure? See, but Paul tells us that, listen, you don't even get the chance to question God like that. Because God knows exactly what he is doing. Amen. It did not catch him by surprise. We learned that God has the right to be God. Amen. We can trust that he knows what he's doing. God knows what he's doing. And, and who are we to argue with him? We, we find out from Isaiah that God says, listen, my ways are not your ways. You don't even come close. I was talking to uh, somebody this week, and I was telling them that it's, it's interesting how, how when we think about ourselves, we look at the universe, you start to count the stars, and you start to see how minuscule we are. And matter of fact, when you want to count the billions of people that, that are here today, plus all the billions that have ever been created, how minuscule we are. And then God said, listen, I ain't going to even give y'all full brain capacity. You know, y'all think too much of yourself right now. I ain't going to even give you 10%. See, see, and we question God and we learn that God says, listen, I am the potter. You are the clay. I have a right to do with my creation as I see fit. See, we have to trust that God knows what he's doing. Amen. In Romans 9, we came face to face with the sovereignty of God to do as he pleases with his creation. And so, so listen, we, we wrestled with the how can God be in total control and yet hold us responsible for our choices. See, understand this. This is a, a, a biblical, this is a healthy biblical tension that every Christian has to wrestle with. God's choice versus our choice. God's election Versus our responsibility. It's a healthy tension. Listen, we're, we're not going to solve that problem, but the Bible teaches that God is sovereign control of everything, and yet we are still responsible for our decisions. If you got a question for him, you can ask him when you get to heaven, but I believe you won't be asking him that question. But that's a healthy tension we wrestle with. Amen. In Romans chapter 10, the apostle Paul focuses on our responsibility to respond to the gospel message by faith alone, in Christ alone. See, what we're dealing with, Marilyn, here is in the in-between. How do we live in between the time when we got saved and in the time we, we got to heaven? It's by, get to heaven, it is by faith and by faith alone. See, what we see here, Paul starts back at Romans 9, 30 through 32 by posing another question. 
says here in the scripture, what shall we say? What should we say then? Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, or namely the righteousness that comes from faith, but Israel pursuing the law for righteousness has not achieved the righteousness of the law. Why is that? Because they did not pursue it by faith but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. See, what he's saying here is, listen, as Gentiles, that's us, amen, uh, in case we got, unless we got some Messianic Jews in here, uh, the Gentiles received righteousness by faith in Christ alone. It was the Jews who were chasing righteousness by keeping the law. The law was showing them that you can chase, but you'll never, ever be made righteous by the law. That's why Jesus had to come. See, they tried to work for it, but Jesus had already given it. And because Jesus had given it, he became that stumbling stone. The stone that the builders rejected was the very one that Israel was stumbling over. The very one that could give them the righteousness that they were chasing after. The one that could give them the right standing that they were seeking with God became the very one that they were falling over. See, in Romans 10, verses 1 through 4, Paul again reveals his heart for Israel. We learned in chapter 9, Paul, Paul was talking about the fact that, listen, he, he hurt so bad for his brothers in chapter 9, that he said, listen, I, I would be willing to give my spot up in heaven if they were to be saved. Amen? In, in Romans chapter 10, starting at verse 1, his heart is still heavy for Israel. He says this in verse 1, brothers, my heart's desire in prayer to God concerning them is for their salvation. He said, I can testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, because they... They disregarded the righteousness from God and attempted to establish their own righteousness. They have not submitted themselves to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone to believe. The law for righteousness to all who believe. See, they were trying to fulfill the law, you know, like us. Some of us, we, we, we want to, to, to be righteous by our own acts. You know, there's some folks that haven't even come to Christ yet because they're trying to get themselves together. A -a Amen. I'm going to get myself together. Have you ever shared the gospel with somebody that Jesus Christ died for your sins? Well, yeah, I hear you, brother, but there's some things I got to get together. I got, you know, I got to stop cussing first. I, you know, I got to put down that bottle first. And I got to do this first. I got to do that first. And they don't recognize there ain't nothing you can do to clean yourself up. Ain't enough bleach. Amen. The only bleach that can clean your sins is the bleach of the blood. Amen? Listen, many of us uh, today are guilty of misdirected zeal. This zeal is an intense desire. We are zealous for the wrong things. See, see many of us, like them, we're, we're zealous for our careers. We're, we're, we're zealous about swelling up our bank accounts. We're, we're, sweat, we're, we're zealous about our physical fitness. Our, we're zealous about our families, and we're zealous about our leisurely pursuits. And some of those things that we're zealous for are more than we're zealous for the things of God. See, see, we'll spend countless hours pursuing things that will perish instead of pursuing the one who has given us what is eternal. Amen. I, I count up all the hours back in the day when I was chasing that dollar. Amen. I, I, would, I would I often share when I went to work, my kids would sleep. When I came home, my kids would sleep. And, and I justify by saying, man, I got to pay these bills. I got, I got to do this. I got to get a bigger house. I got to get a better car. I got, I got, I'm taking care of my family while I was missing my kids and missing my Jesus. Well, I, I give God an hour or two, a shout out, amen, on a Sunday, give him a high five and say, God, you should be good. I'll see you next week. But see, I'm zealous. I know some folk that will fight you over their tea time. But when it comes to the things of God, amen, oh, I'm sorry, dog, I can't make it. You know, I got this, I got that, I got this. What are we zealous for? See, see, we'll, we'll chase after those things that perish 
instead of chasing after God. Paul was telling them, listen, I, I know the zeal that they have. They, they had a zeal, but it was misdirected because he had that same zeal. It was that zeal that caused Paul to go after the Christians. He thought he was doing something for God. I, I'm going after those ones, amen, who claim that they know this Christ because they are not following after the God of Isaac, Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said this zeal is misdirected because it's not according to knowledge. You see, see, they misunderstood, amen. Jesus himself chastised the Pharisees for their zeal. You think you know some religious folk. Them Pharisees were super religious, amen. You remember the, the, the folks praying in the temple, and the Pharisee looked over at the other guy and says, oh, Lord, I am so glad that I'm not like him. Yeah, we got them in church. We got them in church. None of y'all here. Amen. We got them in church. We got, got, got a zeal for religion. Jesus said, listen, you Pharisees. He said, you strain at a net, but you swallow a camel. You strain at the minutia of the law. Yet you miss the principle, amen? It's folk that'll fight you. Ladies, they'll be out there with a measuring tape on your skirt, amen, but will fail to display love. It's like the police officer writing you a ticket for blocking traffic because your car is broke down in the middle of the road. They miss the principle. Yeah, you blocking, you impeding traffic. But the principle is your safety is above everything. See, many folks in church, they're so caught up in their religiosity, their zeal for trying to be so Christian that they miss the love that God has called us to. They got a zeal. They, they got a zeal. They, they chasing after him. See, see, they missed the fact that Jesus was the end of the law. They trying to keep the law. Jesus said, I'm, I'm, I did the law. I handled that. They like, well, we trying to do this. He said, listen, I'm on my way to the cross. That's it. It's, it's done. Amen. It's done already. You just have to accept the gift. Amen. They were so concerned, again, with their views that they forgot the love the Lord their God. They forgot to love their neighbor as themselves. They missed the fact that, again, Jesus had already come to fulfill it. Amen. He had already taken care of it. All they had to do was believe in him. Paul goes on to tell his listeners that the gospel message is near. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. Listen to verses 6 through 8. He says, but the righteousness that comes from faith speaks like this. Do not say in your heart who will go up to heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will go in, down into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. On the contrary, what does it say? The message is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. This is the message of faith that we proclaim. L listen, there, there ain't no need for anyone to, to be asked to bring Jesus down. He already did that. He stepped down from heaven, born of a virgin, amen, became incarnate. He already did that. It's no need for nobody to go and raise him up from the dead. He raised himself up voluntarily, amen, three days later. What, what, what you trying to do? You, you think you can call him down, amen? You think you can raise him up? It's already been done. That message is near to you. What Paul was telling his hearers is that the message of salvation is right here in your ears. It's not a far off. It's right here. Jesus told them, listen, the kingdom of God is at hand. They looking around. They didn't understand that he had already brought the kingdom to them. And there was no need, amen. The message of righteousness by faith in Paul's day was near his readers. It was available to them. What Paul is talking about is a rhema word, a word of faith, amen. The spoken word that was there, the gospel was there and available to them and accessible to them. See, I said all that to say this, that we must do our part. 
We must do our part. It's right here in the scriptures, verse uh, 9 through 10 of chapter 10 says this. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, y'all know it, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. Don't, don't miss the, the grammar language. Don't miss the shalls. Don't re- miss the wheels that are, that are in here. See, Jesus is Lord is thought to be the oldest Christian confessional statement. See, it was a clear expression of the deity of Christ. See, there's no getting around it that Jesus is God. Amen. When we when we look at this word, this word Lord, Kyrios, was the Greek word used in the Septuagint, which is simply the Greek translation of the Old Testament, to translate the Hebrew word Yahweh, which is the personal name of God. This name is sacred to the Jews. Now, now listen, you, you got to understand, you know, we, we play with the name of God. Uh, the, uh, the Jews don't play with the name of God. This is God's personal name. They listen. They it was it, they wouldn't even say His name when the scribes would write out the Word of God. They would come to a name. They would stop, stop writing, go cleanse themselves, come back and begin to write again. They had so much reverence. For the name. So for the for Paul to write, Jesus is Lord, is a, is a shot over the bow to them. Because they're saying, there is no other Lord but God. And so what he was saying, I'm equating Jesus with the very one that you know as God. See, he's not playing. He's not playing. There, there's no mistaking of Paul's intent here. Amen. For a Jew to confess Jesus as Lord would be to, again, to ascribe deity to Jesus of Nazareth, the very source of the Jewish outrage that led to his crucifixion in Jerusalem. It's a reason when, when Jesus went to the synagogue and he read from the scroll of Isaiah and he turned them and it was a drop mic moment. He told them, listen, today in your hearing, this has been fulfilled. And he was like, yeah. <laughs> Said the Jews became outraged because they knew that their scriptures pointed to the coming Messiah. And he was saying, yeah, that's me. See, when we look at this, Jesus is Lord. He is the one who is the ruler. He was the one that was there from the beginning. Amen. Paul was speaking to this Jewish nation that was locked in unbelief. Jewish, these, these thought, they saw Jew, Jesus as a faker. They saw Jesus as a phony. They saw Jesus as a perpetrator to the throne. But yet he was God and he became a stumbling stone to Israel. Listen, they had, Israel had stumbled over him just 25 years earlier in Jerusalem. And even as Paul was penning this letter, they were still stumbling over him. And even today, they continue to trip. See, but confessing Jesus as his Lord is not the whole gospel. In fact, it is an outward public expression of a heart-held belief. It, it, listen, it is our part and responsibility to express publicly what has happened inwardly and he said confess with your mouth i know some of y'all uh real legalistic scholars right now are, are saying well what if i can't talk listen with your mouth you confess that jesus is lord you can talk let god worry about the one who can't amen It is a public expression. Thus comes the other half of the message of faith. That is to affirm that Christ had indeed been raised from the dead. See, the resurrection is an essential. You can't get around it. You know, I know some Christians, we don't don't celebrate uh, Easter. Well, I'm not talking about the word. I'm talking about celebrating the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you don't believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, that is an essential tenet of the faith. Amen? 
See, the resurrection is essential. It, is a, it was an essential part of the apostles preaching in the early days of the gospel ministry, and it became central, a central part to Paul's teaching to all the churches. If you read Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 17, listen to this. I'm just sharing what the word says because I don't want you to think it's me. It says this, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is without foundation. And so is your faith. In addition, we are found to be false witnesses about God. Because we have testified about God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if the fact if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Listen, if there is no resurrection, there is no Christianity. There is no resurrection. Hey, good to see you, Jeff. Man, happy you came out. Why are you here today? If there's no resurrection, hey, oh, why you, you could have been in the gym this morning. Hey, man, why, why, if there's no resurrection, then where, you, sorry, Marilyn, you're not my sister. I, I, I'm sorry, Keisha, I don't know what, what you're singing about. Because if there is no resurrection, there is no Christianity. If there is no resurrection, there is no gospel message. If there is no resurrection, there is nothing for us to be here for. But there was a resurrection. He did get up from the dead, and one day we will rise as well. It's essential. It's essential. Paul is telling them, listen, Paul would have the church remember that the resurrection is central to the gospel. Says, uh, talks about if we confess. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with our heart that you believe and are justified and then with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Listen, what the heart believes, the mouth confesses. <laughs> Listen, I love Deidre with, with all my heart, amen, and, and, and it would be great. But if I never confessed my love to her, we would have never made it to the altar. Because it's one thing to believe. Baby, you know, you know I, 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 love, I, love, I love you. <laughs> the, the, don't, don't, you don't you see it? Right, right, because it, it's some, for some folks, if you love me, you shouldn't have no problem saying it, amen. You see, see, it's the, it's the heart. The, Jesus tells us that our mouth reveals what's in our heart. It's not your mouth that's corrupt. It's your heart. Listen, when I used to cuss folk out, that, that just didn't come from my mouth. That came from well deep within me. It, it, it was a representation of the corruption that was taking on, taking place in my heart. I know, know some of y'all. Oh, I just spoke from my head. No, you didn't. Some cleanup that has to happen in our heart. Listen, no, I know some of y'all. You know, we still, still struggle with that. Just continue to let the Lord work on your heart. Amen. It's a heart matter. Contrary to, to the famous drill sergeant credo, where the head goes, the body follows, Paul's creed is this. It is consistent with that of James that on the, the Lord's half-brother, belief and confession are like faith and works. They tr the truly saved will always ultimately manifest a complimentary expression of their new life in Christ. If you truly have been changed, it will be expressed in what you do and what you say. If you truly been changed, it will come out. Amen. It will show. Amen. See, all of these things, when we, we look at the fact that faith sometimes can immediately lead to a confession as it did with Paul. When Paul got knocked off his high horse, amen, he became a preaching machine. Or sometimes it may slowly happen as it did with some of the Jewish leaders who were coming in to see Jesus in the dark. They, they believed, but they, they had a little struggle. Amen. And some of us are, are a little slow. Some of us, we, we get it right away. Some of us, God is still working on us. But it shall be reflected one way or another by what we say. 
See, ultimately, however, Jesus himself indicates that confession of our faith is a requirement. Even in the face of impending persecution, we must be willing to stand up for our faith. See, the point is that if we confess, repent, or baptize, believe, and try to enter the kingdom of God in the flesh as Israel had done, it will be to no avail. If we do all this stuff, amen, without faith, we are just spinning our wheels. All of those things must be done, but they must be done believing or not done at all. Now, now, let me share this with you. I shared uh, with my Tuesday night Bible study class a little while ago that, that this uh, very famous uh, homicide detective who is an apologist for the faith right now shared that there's a difference of being believing and believing in. He said you can believe that and you can believe in. The demons believed that Jesus Christ was the Lord, amen, and the Bible says they believed and trembled. Amen. But for us, we must believe in the Christ who went to the cross for us. It's a difference. Amen. We must believe in. So we can do all the stuff, but we must believe in the Christ that called us, and we must believe in him by faith. See, all this can be done, but we must believe by faith faith and that is the sense of faith that belief that is at the core of our Christian walk listen the thief on the cross he didn't get a chance to take go to the connection table he didn't get a chance to fill out a membership card he, he, he didn't get a chance to get the right hand of fellowship he, he didn't get a chance to go out and, and join a ministry sing in the choir matter of fact he didn't even say the sinner's prayer what's wrong with him he simply said, remember me when you go into your kingdom. Remember me. He, he heard that, that you saw that conversation that was going on in the cross. He believed in the one that was hanging in between him and his partner. He believed in him that he had a place to, in heaven that he would give him. And Jesus told him that today. Jesus didn't say, listen, you know what? I'm absolving you. You can get down. I'll just He didn't knock him down off the cross. And, and he said, no, today. He didn't even change his. He, he didn't even say, listen, you're not going to, you, you're going to die. You, you're going to serve the penalty for, for in the flesh right now for your sin. But today, when, when you give up the ghost, when, 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 when all is said and done, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, now imagine if, if this could happen in heaven. The thief is there. Imagine the one who used to own the store that the thief is stole from. How'd you get here? Oh, I, I've been walking with the Lord a long, long time. How, how'd you get here? I just believed. And see, see, it's available to everyone. Uh, let, let me push to a close. So, so we do our part. Our part is to believe. Believe in Jesus by faith, in Christ alone. Amen. By faith alone. Ain't nothing you can do you can't work for. Confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart. And then understand this, that if we, the believing is our part, we must believe. But anyone in whom faith springs up and, and begins to bear fruit will or have done all those things. They'll, they'll be walking with the Lord. They'll be following the Lord. We'll do those things because we actually believe. But listen, when you do your part, God is always going to do his part. Amen. We have to believe, but God is going to do his part, and that's to save. Amen. See, God does his part. He saves. Romans 10, verses 11 through 13 says this. Now, the scripture says, everyone who believes on him now uh, will not be put to shame. He said, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, since the same Lord of all is rich to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. See, in verse 11, we see here, salvation comes through acknowledging to God that Christ is God and believing in him. See, Paul supported his position by requoting part of Isaiah 28, 16, and he added to the translation, everyone, everyone 
See, God responds with the gift uh, he has provided by giving righteousness to each individual who believes. A righteousness that you can't get on your own. Amen. It's deposited to your account. Paul uses this word. It's an accounting term called imputed, which means it is it is credited to your account. All of us born in sin, shaped in iniquity, came with a sin debt. We were spiritually bankrupt. But when we say yes to Jesus, he accredited righteousness to your account. Amen. So so when, when God looks at your account, he sees that you are loaded with Christ's righteousness. See, some of us, we think that we can add to the account. You can't add to the account. God is the only one that gives to that account. See, God is the one who sent his son, amen, who was judged for us, and now we've been richly blessed. And I love this part. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, be careful who you call on. You see, it's calling on the name of the Lord. See, here it means that name that we pray in faith, the one that we stand in faith for salvation. We call on Jesus. Amen. It's something about that name. Yeah, something about that name. Uh, listen to, to Acts 3, 3 through, one, 3 through 8. It says this, when, when, when Peter, let me paraphrase for the, for the sake of time. Listen, Peter and John were, were doing as they normally do. They were, were on their way to the synagogue, seeing Deuce out there with his uh, legs crossed, begging. He had been sitting out there for years, amen, hadn't walked in, in ages, amen. And, they, and, and he's like, hey, hey, arms, arms, arms. You know, give me some money. You know how they do at the, at the, at the gas station or whatever. Give me alms, alms, give me some money. And, and, and Peter looked at him and said, silver and gold I have not. <laughs> but what I do have, in the name of Jesus, stand. He took his hand, took him up. The man not only got up, he said he started leaping. Then, then as he was leaping, he the same synagogue that he had been outside begging all this ye all these years he went in jumping and shouting showing that in the name amen healing happens in that name deliverance happens in that name conversion happens in that name transformation happens in that name in that name the lame walk in that name the blind see in that name, the mute speak. In that name, the sinner is saved. In that name, in that name. The, in Philippians, it says this, verses, uh, chapter 2, verses 10 through 11, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God, the Father. Some about that name. Listen, there's salvation in the name. You do your part. You call on the name of Jesus. He's going to do his part. He'll save. Let me leave you with this. A little boy came running into the house after playing outside. His mother stopped him and asked what was on his right hand. He replied, oh, just a little mud. His mother then asked if he was planning to on getting it off his hand. And he thought for a moment and said, sure, mom, I'll just wipe it off with my other hand. There was only one problem with that plan. One dirty hand plus a clean hand equals two dirty hands. See, many people are like that little boy. They see the evil and wrongs in their life and think they can make themselves clean by bringing the good in their life to bear on the problem. But it doesn't work that way. See, see, we all need a way to be made morally and spiritually clean. And, and we will never succeed in doing it ourselves. The only solution is to be found in the blood of Jesus Christ, see, which cleanses us from all our sins by faith alone in Christ alone. See, the gospel is a message of faith that must be believed by faith in Christ alone. See, the faith is our responsibility. Amen. But the saving is Christ's responsibility. 
See, we must believe. Now, why are you saying this, preacher? We, we know God. We, we know Jesus. I already confessed with my mouth. See, God's word is full of reminders. See, see you need to be reminded that, that what you've confessed with your mouth. You need to be reminded of what you say you believe in your heart. You need to ask yourself, is that reflected in how I live? Is that reflected in how I treat my neighbor? Is that reflected in how I treat my coworkers? Is that a reflected? See, we must believe. Do your part. It's by faith alone in Christ alone. God don't need you to add nothing to what he's already done. What he's done should drive us to obedience. It should drive us to follow the master. See, you want to live by faith? You got to walk by faith. You got to believe by faith. And the faith that you need is the faith in Christ. It is faith that is available to everyone who believes in him. Do your part. He always does his part. Amen. Give God a hand of praise. He is a good, good father. Amen. Amen.